Hey, welcome to First Moss Bluffs online worship experience. We're so glad that you came today. We're looking forward to people from all around the world gathering together. You know, people are sitting around tables, sofas, and offices, and they're even joining us literally from other nations. Though we can't be together physically, we are meeting around the world digitally. And what that means for us is that our church has never been so big as it is today. So there's room for everyone. So who are you inviting today? I want you to listen to this promise. Where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, his promise is that he will be there with us. And so here's some action points for us today. Number one, lean in. Two, sing out. And three, respond. Enjoy this great time together. Hey, church family, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you join us over the next few minutes and sing these songs with us as we praise King Jesus? All praise belongs to him. Let's worship together today, church.
church, we continue to sing. Declare it. Oh, declare it.
Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. and honor unto thee. Thank you, Jesus. How great is your love, how 
there has never been and there will never be a God like you love so true there has never been there will never be a God like you a love so true there has never been and there will never be a God like you a love so never been and there will never be a God like you a love so that's poured out lavishly upon us. Thank you that you don't withhold your love and your grace and your mercy and your kindness from us. God, but in all that you are, you pour it out and you cover us with all that you are. Thank you for meeting us here in this moment. For moving in our presence. We worship you and we sing these words and we sing these songs all in the almighty powerful name of Jesus Christ. Most of the decisions we make every day are inconsequential. There comes a time when you have to make a hard decision, a decision that could even be dangerous in nature. Now, how do you do that? We know that God has a best level of living for us. He wants us to live on that, and most of that time is living by faith and not by how we can work these things out. I want to look today in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Many of you will recognize that as the story of David and Goliath. I want you to open your Bible because I'm not going to read all the Scripture to you. I'm going to point them out for, so that you can write, make notes and write down the things that you feel like you need to retain. So I ask the question, if, if I'm not going to settle for less than God's best for me, I have to ask the question, first of all, how do I miss God's best for my life? Because most of us have done that. We look back and say, boy, did I ever make a mistake there that I should have done something differently from that. Now, when we look at David and Goliath, the scene is set, and there, there are two kings basically standing here in the same circumstances. Tall Saul is the king of Israel, and God has rejected him, but he's still leading the army. And in chapter 16, the chapter previous to this, Samuel has anointed young David, the shepherd boy, as the king. 
So we've got two kings facing the same circumstances, looking at the same situation, but reacting tremendously different from one another. Now, because they're facing the same circumstances, one is older, one is younger, one is an experienced king, one is a king that is anointed, but he's still a shepherd in his vocation. So age and position does not matter in circumstances like this. They are facing a hard decision. What do we do with this problem out here called Goliath? So what happens is I, I begin to focus on my problems, and that causes me to miss because I'm not focusing on the problem solver. Now, if you got your Bibles open to 1 Samuel 17 and you read verses 4 through 10, this is basically what it says. A champion went out. From the, from the camp of Philistines named Goliath. He's a champion. He has never lost. He is facing this Israeli army and the king of the Israeli army, and he's challenging them. And he's challenged them in such a way that a hard decision has to be made. Are we going to fight him? Or are we going to run from him? What are we going to do? And each of the kings, Saul and David, each have a completely different answer. They have each made a different decision about themselves. Now, you and I have faced this before, that we focus on our problems. What that does is that causes drama. Do you know anybody that lives in drama all the time? Gloom, despair, and agony on end. Nothing is ever right. Something's always wrong. We're always blaming the government. We're blaming our spouse. We don't like our job, and nothing is ever right because we're focusing on the problem. Anytime we focus our life on the problem, our life is going to become a problem to those that we're dumping this on. This drama opens up obsessions to us. So that's all we talk about. That's all we're looking at. And it it develops fear. It develops rebellion in us. It develops rejection in us. And that, that then leads to negative confession. I hate my boss. I don't like my home. I don't like my job. I don't like the school. I don't like the president. I don't like Congress. And we begin to negatively confess about these things in our life it's for one reason. We're focusing on the problem, not the solution or the problem solver. We've, this giant comes out. The Bible indicates that he's 10 or 11 feet tall. His weapons are such that the normal man could not even use them. They're so large. I mean, it is a huge problem. But if you focus on the huge problem, then you're missing the huger God that has put us in a situation, a problem to be solved. Now, we miss God's best when my expectation is defeat. I'm just not going to win this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to lose. There's no way I can come out. This is a no-win situation any way that you look at it. If you've got your Bible open, you look at verse 11. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly, greatly afraid. So fear has overtaken them now. They expect that they can't win that this giant who has challenged them for one man to come out and fight him, they just know it's useless. There's, there's no one that can do this. And, and focusing on the problem, they now have come into a place to where expectation is uh, for defeat is what they're living in now. But, but let me just remind you, getting knocked down, getting beat up, that's not defeat. Not getting up again is defeat. If you're going to get knocked down, make sure you get up one time more than you've been knocked down. Because the only time I'm defeated is when I give up, when I stop trying, when I no longer face the problem with some kind of expectation that I can get through this, that I'm going to end up getting through this and it's going to be all right. Because this expectation of defeat keeps me from trying. Why would I even bother if I know that I can't defeat this problem, if I can't work through this problem? This antagonism that they feel, that David feels, he feels this spiritual antagonism inside. Why are we letting this guy say these things? Why doesn't somebody go out and do something? The people that experience God's best in their lives, in their decisions, are those that reach this place of spiritual antagonism. I'm not going to let the devil do that to my child. I'm not going to let the devil wreck my home. I am not going to let the devil put this negative confession in me. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to speak positively. We reach this place of spiritual antagonism to where we're fed up, and we're not going to take it anymore from the enemy, and we're going to do something about it. It. 
Remember, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. These people have responded separately, differently. Saul is filled with fear. David is filled with faith. Saul has been successful with his army. David has been successful with his sling. But when the real press comes, Saul has nothing to stand on. God has rejected him. God doesn't speak to him anymore because of his sin. David spends his days and his nights writing worship music about God because of the presence of God in his life. I also miss God's best when my attitude becomes one of self-protection. I've got to protect myself. That's the main thing I have to do. And this, look, this is completely opposite of what Jesus taught us. Jesus did not say we need to protect ourselves. Jesus said we need to die to ourselves. That we are crucified in him, but we live in the power of his might. When I begin to do self-protection and try to stay alive, I end up like Adam and Eve in the garden, lying or blaming or accusing to keep the attention off of myself. I don't want to be caught doing the wrong thing. I don't want to be blamed. I don't want to take the responsibility for this kind of defeat. This was the second sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. The first sin was listening to the deception of Satan that caused the downfall of the human race and caused the entire creation to go into decay. The second sin was blaming other people. Lord, it was the snake. It was the snake who deceived me. Adam says, Lord, it's that wife that you gave me. I'm protecting myself. I'm hiding from God. I'm making me some clothes now so that he won't see me without clothes. I, I am going to cover myself. When we began to self-protect ourselves, it's not my fault. I didn't do that. It's her fault. He did this thing. It's somebody else's fault. Then we're already defeated. Because we're living a lie, or we're living in fear, or we're living in deception. Here's the fourth principle. I'm going to miss God's best if my response to hard situations is to run. Looking at verse 24. Got your Bible? Look at it with me. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the response is, let's run. Let, let, let's, let's, let's just get away from this. Let's ignore this thing and move ourselves to another place. Now, how does that translate into our culture? Absent father. He may live at home, but he's not taking any responsibility. He's not doing anything for the family. He's just there. He, he takes no part in the responsibilities of the home. He's an absent father. He may stay gone for, for some days doing what he wants to do. He may spend all of his time with his friends or doing some hobby somewhere. He's just absent. What, what is he doing? He's running from responsibility. He's giving his responsibility as a father, as a dad, to someone else to do while he runs from that. To abandon responsibility is to run from the situation. I'm not deciding anything. I'm not being successful at anything. Sometimes unresolved conflict is our way of running. I'm just going to ignore it. I don't want to talk about it. We're not going to resolve this. Let's just ignore it. Let's just, just act like it didn't happen. And what we're doing is we're running away from something that needs to be settled. And the decision we're making is not to decide. But let me just tell you, let me remind you, not to decide is to decide. I've decided not to deal with the giant standing right in front of me. Let's just ignore him. Let's just act like he's not here. Another phrase that people use a lot is, I'm out of here. I'm not going to deal with this. I I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm just gone. I'm just out of here. We decide to run a lot in our life. We may not phrase it that way, but that's what the action reveals. So if this is how I miss God's best for my life, how do I decide for God's best in my life? Life is all about decisions. We make hundreds of them every day. So how do I decide for God's best in my life in one of these strong, hard, dangerous situations I find myself in? Well, it starts this way. My focus is on faith. I've got to have something to stand on. So my focus is on faith. Got your Bible? Look in verses 23 through 27 
with me. And so the Bible says, as he talked with them, there was a champion of the Philistine, Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of Philistine, and he spoke to them, and all the men of Israel were afraid. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for this man who kills, who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised, meaning non-Jewish, Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. David says, all right, if I do this, somebody does it, what's the benefit? What's going to happen for him? He has no fear in his heart. He's standing on faith. He's standing on principles that have been tried and true in his own life. Sometimes you may say, you know, I want to trust God, but I don't know how. I don't, I don't know what to base that on. And when we want to trust God, but we don't know how to trust God, then, then we end up just hoping things work out. Now, where does faith come from? You've heard me say many times, and you need to know where this is. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, the Word of Christ. So I don't need more faith at times. I need more of the Word because this puts faith inside of me. David wrote great passages of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired him. The Word was in him. So his faith was strong. So many don't know what to believe God for because they don't have a working knowledge of the Word of God. They don't know what God expects. They don't know what God wants. And some of us just ignore what we already know. Look, you encouraged others at times. Where is that faith now? You once believed God for great things in your life. But now you're having a come apart. Where is that faith now? When we focus on faith, God is much bigger than the giant. He's much bigger than the circumstance. And my faith must carry me through that it's not my ability, but it's God's ability that's going to get me through this thing. It's a sad thing that so often we equate God's ability with our ability. If we don't believe we can do this, God probably can't either. I, I, I can't pay my bills. God's probably going to struggle with it also. It's just not going to happen. So I must focus on faith rather than fear. My expectation is God's help. What do you mean? Well, let's look in our Bible. In verse 47, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands, David told the giant. So the battle is the Lord's. So my expectation is for help. He said he would be there for me. This is how God, this is how God characterized himself in Psalm 46, 1. He, he is a present help in time of trouble. He is there. He said he would be. That's part of the word of God. I'm going to believe that. I choose to believe that, that he himself is going to be present in some of the hardest, most dangerous decisions that I'm going to make. You say, well, I don't feel his presence. I'm not talking about feeling. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about the fact of what God said. I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to believe it. My expectation in this is that God's going to come through. God is going to deal with this beyond my sword, beyond my spear, that's not what it's about. It's about the help of God. My attitude is one of impact. Again, looking in the Word. Verse 46, this day, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day will I give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's David talking to the Goliath. You come to me with spear and sword. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And this day, all of Israel will know that there is a God amongst us. Impact. God is worthy of this. David wasn't all about himself. He wants to accomplish something bigger than himself. He's killed a bear, and he's killed a lion that's tried to bother his sheep. But now he's going to kill the enemy of God and the enemy of Israel, and that is going to put him in the eyes of the people as a hero. 
His purpose is to take away the reproach of the Lord that is being cast out right here. He wants to be something bigger than what he has been. I want to do something bigger than I've ever done and do it in the name of the Lord so that people might be impacted by the power of God, by the help of God, that God has come through for me. I want people, when I make a decision and the impossible circumstances become possible and it all works out like a miracle, I want people to look at God and say, wow, because honestly, God is wow worthy. When we face a dangerous decision, a hard decision, the glory of God is always at stake. If our faith is in Him, God is going to be glorified or He's not going to be. I want to be a part of winning for the kingdom as David did. Now, the response to all of this, and it's time to make a decision. So what do I do? So my response, according to what David did, is to run toward my destiny. It's to run toward my destiny. You got your Bible open? I'm looking in verse 48 now. So the Bible says, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He didn't just run toward the giant. He ran toward the giant's army. He was anxious to see God work and do something in this situation. Sometimes my destiny is to destroy the enemy that's threatening my home. Destroy the enemy that's threatening my church. Destroy the enemy that's threatening my life. I'm running toward my destiny. When David kills this giant Goliath, in the eyes of the people, he will be exalted above King Saul. He will at this point recognize his destiny in the eyes of the people. They will recognize his destiny because of what God has done through him. Run toward it. Run for it. When I was a young preacher, 15 years old, didn't have a driver's license, had to get people to carry me to the churches, invited me to preach. People said to me very often, you're too young to do this. You're too young to fill a pulpit. You're too young to preach. At one point, my own father said this. Now, that's discouraging. But I held on to 1 Timothy 4.12 that says, let no man despise your youth. And that's what I clung to. I ran toward my destiny, even when I couldn't drive toward it. I ran toward my purpose in God. The truth is, I will never possess what I'm not willing to pursue. If God wanted me to wait until I was older, he would have waited that long to call me to preach. But he called me, anointed me, and he gave me purpose at that age, and I began to run for it, began to Do it immediately, and that's what brought about my destiny. So what are the benefits of choosing God's best? So you're going to stand, and you're going to make the hard and dangerous decision. In the very face of adversity, the very face of of the enemy, what's the benefit? Three, let me just hit them very quickly. They're self-explanatory. Number one, God is honored because God does the work. God is the one bringing it about. He is the one giving me anointing and power and working this out. And so it gives him glory that is due his name. Let's read verse 46 again. The end of that verse, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. God is glorified. He gets a wow from people who are paying attention. And again, God is wow worthy because he's glorious in what he does. So, God is glorified. Secondly, I'm blessed. I am blessed to see God work and be a part of what God does. I'm looking at verse 50 now. Got your Bible open? Verse 50. So David prevailed. Look at that word. He prevailed. He won. He overcame. He hung in there until it was settled. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. He did it with a rock. If you read this story closely, you'll see that when David slung that rock at the giant, the Bible says, and the giant fell on his face before David. I thought about that as a child. When I first began thinking about this story, hearing preachers preach about it, teachers teach about it, 
I wondered if somebody hit me with a rock in the head the size of a golf ball that strong enough to kill me, why would I not fall on my back? Why would I fall on my face? And I never understood that until my wife Susie's grandmother said, I believe because when the rock struck him, he was already on his way down. God had already taken care of the problem when David's effort met him. So he prevailed. He prevailed by doing in faith what God wanted him to do. I prevail. Man, when I prevail in a hard situation, I am blessed. I am so full of God, so full of joy, so full of satisfaction and fulfillment. I am so blessed. I did the unlikely. By his power, God came through. God showed himself strong. God revealed his strong arm to me and in my circumstances, and he did what nobody else could do. I am a blessed man when that happens. One other result, and that is other people are inspired. Other people are inspired. I'm looking at verse 52. Now the giant is dead. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley into the gates of Ekron and wounded of the Philistines that fell along the road to Sherim and even as far as Gath and Ekron. Man, the army has been inspired. They were not inspired under Saul. They remember they turned and fled from the situation. But when David took down that 11 foot tall man, tall Saul couldn't get him to do that. Man, I have stood by the tall Saul sometime when trouble comes and they turn and run away from it. Those who had spoken big things before, those who had presented themselves as being the best around. But David inspired them to where the whole army stopped fleeing from the circumstance and turned around and went with him to pursue the enemy and drive them completely out of the area. I hope that your children are inspired by what you're doing, the decisions you're making, the battles that you are fighting. One of the first miracles I remember ever seeing was in my own home. My mother, when I was about in the seventh grade, my mother began to spend a lot more time with us siblings. It was unusual because she worked. She'd come home from work. She would take us to a movie. She'd never done that before. She'd take us to the beach on the north shore of Lake Charles and sit. I can see her still, the wind blowing her hair, the seabirds flying, and we're playing along the shore, and she's sitting in a little seat just stayed, staring off into the sky. I didn't understand that, but I enjoyed it. And it seemed like she was always doing something with us. It was before she'd come home tired. She, she just wanted to rest. She just wanted to do things, then go to bed, then get up. But it wasn't that way. It was strange. I found out later, years later, that she had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And the prognosis was not very good. And so she was spending as much time with her children as she possibly could, thinking that perhaps that would be the last chance that she had to do that. She went to another state to a medical center. They did the test. They said, yes, it's a brain tumor and something serious is going to have to be done. And we're still not sure that's going to work. So my dad, knowing the prayer warrior that my mother's mother was, my little French-speaking Cajun grandmother, he took my mother to her parents' house. Now, my grandfather was a preacher, but he asked my grandmother to pray. But she was the prayer warrior. And it told her the situation and said, we want to believe God to take care of this thing. And so they knelt down in the bedroom of that little frame house. And my little grandmother prayed in her native tongue, Cajun French, that God would heal her daughter, my mother. She got up from there. They came home. And my mother told my dad, I don't want to go back to the doctor. I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't want to go back. My dad said, I won't force you to do anything, but you understand the seriousness of it. She said, I understand, but I'm just going to trust God. That was oh, 60 years ago. My mother lived to be almost 90 years old. And my little Cajun grandmother prayed the victory, the healing down on her. Was I inspired? I'm still inspired. Does that make me want to believe God? It makes me want to believe God in every dangerous, impossible situation I face. Because I am no longer running. 
I'm running toward the enemy because I know the power of God to change impossible situations. And that's what we learn. Children are inspired. The church is inspired. Seekers who don't even know God look at that, and they're inspired. Two kings, same circumstances. One decides to have God's best. The other decides to run in fear. What will you decide about the enemy when you face him? Let's pray together. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, you put this same faith that you put in David into our hearts. When the enemy shows up, I pray that we would stand firm and strong and face it in the power of your might and that we might prevail as David did. While all others run away, we want to stand and give you glory that you have accomplished your very best in our lives and we will be blessed by it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We believe that everybody has a next step. The next steps for you may be that you follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's ministry of some sort, giving, whatever the case might be. If you're interested in your next steps, text next steps and the number that's located on the bottom of the screen. And we look forward to gathering together once again in worship in the near future. God bless you.